Part 5. The Production Accessing destinations almost always involves trade-offs. We may want a certain job, for example, but there is a limit to the amount of time and money we would be willing or able to spend to access it. This section on the production essentially captures the economics of accessibility. When we talk about economics, we often talk about supply and demand, but accessibility economics means talking about issues related to induced demand and induced supply. It also means connections to our previous sections such as the cost perceptions of people, the agglomeration effects of places, and the network economies of the plexus. This section on the production ties these themes together as they relate to accessibility under an economic umbrella. Chapter 12, Supply and Demand. The economic benefits of travel and activity can be measured through the idea of surplus. Every introductory course in economics covers the topics of supply and demand. As the price falls, the quantity demanded of a good tends to rise. As the price rises, the quantity of a good supply tends to rise. These two curves intersect at a market equilibrium. In microeconomic terms, we can measure total benefits as the sum of consumer and producer surplus. Consumer surplus, shown in figure 12.1, is the difference between willingness to pay, the demand curve, and the price actually paid. If I would pay $10 for a trip, but only actually pay $1, I have $9 of consumer surplus. The producer surplus or profit is the difference between the cost of the producer of providing a service, the supply curve, say a bus, and the price they can charge. The area between the supply and demand curve in a typical economic graph is thus the total benefit. If we charge more than the equilibrium price, producers might get additional profit, but consumers would lose consumer surplus, and the overall benefit would drop. In a robust, idealized market, many producers and consumers come together and find the equilibrium price, which is where the marginal cost of producing the last unit of a good or service equals the marginal benefit to the consumer of purchasing it, and that point is the equilibrium price. Real markets are less idealized than the graphics of the first chapter of introductory microeconomics textbooks. There may be only one producer who has a monopoly on production. Public goods may be subsidized and thus garner no profits at all. There are externalities that are not borne by decision makers. The relationship between consumer surplus, which is the benefit of actual trips, and accessibility, which is the benefits owing to potential travel, can perhaps be squared by thinking about real estate markets. In real estate, the price of land depends mostly on its location with respect to other development. When pricing a house, it depends not on the travel time to one particular destination, but all potential destinations. There is a downward sloping curve. Willingness to pay for real estate decreases as the number of potential destinations that can be reached declines. However, unlike most markets, land is fixed, and the benefits accrue to landholders rather than land purchasers. So the accessibility benefits when assigned to land generates rent, or producer surplus, rather than consumer surplus. The idea of consumer surplus, which is central to economics, was developed by civil engineers in France studying bridge pricing. The ideas of induced demand and induced supply, which are debated in the transport community, are just demand and supply in economic terms. It is the failure to understand this, which was built into simple models of times past, which led to forecasts which understated traffic growth, especially in early years, as it responded to capacity, and failed to consider supply as part of the market, instead treating it as an exogenous policy variable. There are also important distinctions in the supply curve, and to a lesser extent demand curve, about who bears the cost. Externalities are costs borne by those outside the cost of the voluntary market transaction we normally consider and in transport tend to be significant in the source of many transport problems, like congestion, crashes, and pollution. Scarce transport supply is often given away, leading to congestion, but it can be rationed or priced to get a better outcome. Large infrastructure projects tend to require high initial expenditures for construction, as well as an ongoing expense for operations and maintenance, while revenues come only after the project is opened. Ensuring these costs and the revenues balance over time is a job of engineering economics and discussed in life cycle costing. The shapes of these cost and benefit curves are also important and discussed in synergies. It turns out the demand curve is not always downward sloping and the cost curve not always upward sloping. 12.1 Induced Demand Increasing capacity seldom reduces congestion as much as expected. You already have a congested roadway, and the transport planners predict even more traffic on that road in the near future. What do you do? For most of the last century, the answer was to increase capacity. In the short term, this seemed to work. Time and time again, over the long term, the actual amount of traffic after the capacity increase grew far more than expected, as illustrated in Figure 12.2. 
What seemed like an obvious solution to a congestion problem continued to disappoint. But why? The reason for these failures lies with the principle of induced demand. Once capacity increases, not only do you get the originally predicted traffic growth, but you also facilitate some, often unanticipated, changes in travel behavior. First, existing road users might change the time of day when they travel, instead of leaving at 5 a.m. to be traffic. The newly widened road entices them to leave for work with everyone else. Second, those traveling a different route might switch and drive along the newly widened option. Third, those previously using other modes such as transit, walking, bicycling, or even carpooling may now decide to carpool or drive alone instead. Together, these unwanted behavior changes fall under what is termed the theory of triple convergence, also known as the iron law of congestion, in which we discussed earlier in terms of travel time budgets. This latent demand induces more traffic than originally expected and saps the supposed improvement of the expected benefits. Induced demand implies that the trip generated had a higher consumer surplus than no trip or an alternative. So regardless of the congestion, the expansion in capacity had value, the evidence for which is the induced demand. The old joke is that adding lanes to cure congestion is like loosening your belt to cure obesity. Empirical results over the last century, due to the principle of induced demand, have borne out that this issue is real and should always be accounted for when considering adding capacity as a solution to congestion. 12.2 Induced Supply and Value Capture The mirror problem to induced demand is induced supply. All too often, the response to congestion is to expand roads. This supply was induced by the changing demand patterns. There's a great deal of evidence that supply responds to market conditions in the transport sector, even though, in the modern world, it is often mediated by political institutions. Consider, for instance, the London Underground. Not only did new underground stations induce new development and encourage more people to travel longer distances, more people encouraged rail promoters to build new lines to serve them, the most promising of which were approved by Parliament. It was a positive feedback system of the kind drawn above. In this case, the value was captured by land developers who benefited from new stations, new lines, and the accessibility they provided. In some cases, the land developers and the transit line builders were the same people, for instance along the Metropolitan Line in London, where the Metroland suburbs were constructed. This is also not just a transit phenomenon. It applies in principle equally well to the highway side. The same processes continue to occur, though for all modes there are diminishing returns to mature systems, so a route in a city with many uncongested lines is far less valuable than a route in a city with few lines or with crowded lines. To the extent that the benefits from new infrastructure can be captured to pay for that new infrastructure, as in figure 12.3, more infrastructure will be created. This process, dubbed value capture, has many possible mechanisms, but in many cases is not implemented in the U.S. context, where the public provides infrastructure, the benefits are captured privately, and then people complain about a lack of infrastructure. 12.3. Cost Perception The costs you pay per trip differ from the costs you incur. If you drive, you might pay for the cost of owning your car, the cost of insurance, the cost of tolls, and the cost of fuel. Generally, the cost of the car and insurance are independent of how much you drive, while the cost of tolls and fuel vary with distance. We say the cost of the car and insurance are fixed, as they do not change with the amount of travel, while the cost of toll and fuel are variable. As a result, when thinking about making one more trip, you will consider the variable cost but tend to discount or ignore entirely the fixed cost. This means the marginal cost of each additional trip is lower than the average cost, the total cost divided by the number of trips, and will bias you to driving more than you otherwise would. The present system does not reward drivers when they reduce their mileage. It fails to return to the motorist much of the cost savings realized from driving less. Changing the cost of driving to a method where drivers pay out of pocket for what were fixed costs is actually less expensive overall and has the added advantage of meeting public sector goals of reducing congestion and environmental impacts, limiting new highway construction and expensive maintenance costs. To illustrate, let's assume a vehicle that averages 20,000 kilometers per year. The cost of insurance for that vehicle is $2,000 per year. Registration tag, sales tax, and parking are $1,000 a year, and ownership and lease fees are $4,000 a year. Instead of the fixed cost model, convert those costs to variable costs. Thus, the cost of insurance translates to a distance-based charge of $2,000 divided by 20,000 kilometers, or $0.10 cents per kilometer. Sales tax and parking translate to $1,000 over 20,000 kilometers to $0.05 cents per kilometer, and ownership and leasing fees of $4,000 per year or $4,000 per 20,000 kilometers translate to $0.20 cents per kilometer. Adding these together would add $0.35 cents per kilometer to the cost of a trip. This would give a better signal to the traveler of how much each trip costs to them personally 
and by raising the out-of-pocket price, presumably reduces the amount of travel. This does not even consider social costs or externalities, like air pollution, carbon emissions, crashes, above and beyond what is covered by insurance, and noise, for which cost estimates vary widely but are now clearly underpriced with an effective charge of about $0 per kilometer. Of course, raising the monetary cost of travel reduces the perceived amount of accessibility in terms of the money plus time accessibility. It is now costlier to travel farther. On the other hand, by reducing the demand for travel, speed should rise. 12.4. Externalities Many costs of travel are not borne by the traveler. Some costs are perceived by the traveler and enter into the decision about what mode to use, what route to take, or where to go. While these may be priced imperfectly, these private or internal costs are borne by the traveler. Other costs are not. These are termed externalities or social costs. These include the congestion the traveler causes other people, the pollution they generate, and the noise they make. Congestion externalities differ from the congestion costs travelers suffer. The congestion that travelers endure is caused by the queue of cars ahead of them. The congestion they cause afflicts those behind. We can measure this as the difference in the cost of travel with and without the car in question. This increases travel time for others, which is valued at some value of time. Pollution comes from a variety of sources, as in Beijing in Figure 12.5. Vehicle air pollution is both breathed in by travelers and generated from their tailpipe or the power plant in the case of many electric vehicles. The amount that is generated is costlier than pollution intake because it afflicts not only other travelers, but people anywhere nearby. The cost of this in terms of more particulate matter, carbon monoxide, volatile organic compounds, SO2, NOx, and lead, are measured in terms of the health damage. Looking at how mortality and morbidity vary with pollution levels, and then looking at the value of life, lets us estimate a price for this due to damages. If the cost of avoiding pollution production is less than the cost of pollution damages, then that should be done. Carbon emissions, greenhouse gases, have an even wider effect and a more uncertain cost of damages. The most straightforward way to estimate their price is to estimate the cost to avoid them. This is usually in terms of dollars per ton of emissions. Noise rarely kills or injures people, but it diminishes the quality of life. This can be monetized by looking at the difference in property values with higher and lower noise costs. Houses near airports and highways are cheaper because of the noise externality. The contribution to the noise externality from each car on each link can be estimated and assigned the price based on the reduced land value nearby. Safety is also potentially an externality, but much of it is already internalized with insurance costs, which transfer the cost of crashes from the individual to their auto insurance fund. The exact values of these vary. Congestion clearly varies based on time of day and location, as do the others to a lesser extent. Some estimate that $1 per gallon, 25 cents per liter, would cover the external cost of greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, lower than fuel taxes in many countries, but higher than in the U.S. If travelers considered their social costs, perhaps through higher taxes and tolls, they would travel less. Their effective accessibility, how many opportunities they can reach on a dollar, would also decline. Today, accessibility is heavily subsidized through pollution externalities, borne by society at large, particularly the healthcare system, and real estate costs in terms of noise, though this is a two-way street, and subsidized accessibility also props up real estate costs. A less subsidized system would also help society achieve a more economically efficient amount of accessibility. 12.5 Life Cycle Costing Cash flow diagrams help engineers and planners think about initial and downstream costs and benefits. Arrows pointing up indicate expenditures, arrows pointing down indicate revenue, or vice versa, depending on what you are looking at. The arrows have a height indicating the magnitude of money involved and occur at a time along the timeline, the x-axis. Figure 12.6 shows the cash flow of pavement overlays in a scenario for an existing road. In this example, asphalt roads last 42 years before they need to be completely rebuilt, but require pavement overlays in the interim. Overlays are performed during a pavement life cycle to ensure the pavement maintains a certain quality. Lack of maintenance would eventually result in road closure. For a given road, initial construction occurs in year 0, the first overlay in year 14, the second in year 28, and the road is fully rebuilt in year 42. If you know the discount rate, how much tomorrow's money is worth in today's dollars, you can compare alternative scenarios, for instance using a different material, say Portland cement concrete, that has a higher initial construction cost than bituminous asphalt, but fewer future maintenance costs. It turns out that the answer often depends as much on economic factors like the interest rate, as well as the cost of materials, as on technological factors like which pavement lasts longer. 12.6 Affordability 
Affordability refers to the economic burden that families face when consuming transport services. More specifically, it refers to the transport costs that households pay when accessing fundamental destinations such as work, school, health care, as well as other necessary goods and services. When the cost of reaching such essential destinations begins to consume a relatively high percentage of households' income, this leaves less money for housing, food, clothing, and other things. Housing policies have long been considered under this lens. For instance, according to many policies, the threshold at which the percentage of income being dedicated to housing becomes unaffordable is 30%. Based on this threshold, 55% of U.S. neighborhoods would be considered affordable for the average household. However, overall affordability needs to include both housing and transport, and the Center for Neighborhood Technology created their Housing Plus Transportation Affordability Index under this premise. With respect to transport costs, the literature suggests an affordability threshold of 15%. When including transport costs, only 26% of U.S. neighborhoods are considered affordable for the typical household. There are a few caveats to this kind of analysis. The first is that household sizes vary with location and are typically larger in the suburbs than in the center city which affects the mix of spending as well as absolute amounts. The second is that most of the cost of a house or a car for many people satisfies wants, not needs. A used car provides most of the same service that a new car does, at a fraction of the cost. Most people prefer new, and many spend money on new cars, but that is a choice, not a necessity. A third is that high-income people could choose to pay a higher share of their income for luxuries, and in practice pay a lower share but at low incomes, even 45% for housing and transport might be too much. In The Shock Heard Round the Suburbs, West considered the modal options available and modeled what would happen if gas prices doubled. Given baseline gasoline prices, the average household in only 32 out of over 2,000 census block groups in the Denver region would find transport costs unaffordable. Under a scenario where gas prices doubled, the number jumped to nearly 500 block rooms, as shown in Figure 12.8. In other words, the average household in the exurbs commits what would be considered an unaffordable percentage of household income to commuting in the baseline scenario. While housing is less expensive in those areas, they are also less resilient to shocks to the system, in part because there are few viable modal options available. When fuel prices increase, transport costs can skyrocket for such households. On the other hand, the average household in Denver's more accessible neighborhoods might not even notice such fuel price increases. So if a family moves to the suburbs or exurbs where accessibility is lower in order to be able to afford the house they want, they should also consider the costs of what might now be a much longer commute. Such a move might also exacerbate the job worker spatial mismatch. Thinking about things in the other direction, one of the best ways to improve transit affordability is to improve accessibility. The problem is that in many cities, there's an undersupply of housing in more accessible locations and what housing there is often comes at a premium. This can push lower-income families to locations where modal options are limited and distances are long. And just because a transport option exists doesn't mean that everyone has the financial wherewithal to use that mode. So when talking about affordability, accessibility should be a critical concern. And when thinking about accessibility, it is also worth considering equity of access.